what is normal in one culture can feel very strange in another culture. And because that what that culture actually sees as normal may look strange back to the other culture, and that's something that culture does. It normalizes um, what normalizes things for the people within that culture. So I was having a, a conversation about that with a friend of mine who uh, went to do some mission work in the country of Japan and was working in a um, church there, were helping in their student department. And uh, we were talking about that, and he said, um, even uh, in a completely different culture, they were doing this game in their student ministry, and we laughed because it sounded very similar to what uh, the type of game we would do in, in our student ministry. There was a game, and if whoever lost, they would unveil something that they would have to eat or drink that was edible, but was terrifying to eat or drink. And so the, the, ch- the kids were, you know, like not wanting to lose, and it was just something fun to get them energized. And so um, when he's saying this to me, and I was starting to imagine what that would be in a Japanese culture, and uh, my, my mom actually grew up in Japan, and so she would bring pieces of the Japanese culture into our family, and, uh, um, and so it is a beautiful culture, but when it comes to their culinary delicacies... There are some things that are pretty strange to us, but might be normal to them. Let me just give you a couple examples, and I'm, because it's like right before lunch, okay, I'm not going to give you the most extreme, or at least extreme to us type of examples. Let me just give you a couple. There is a, a dish that is a delicacy in Japan where you consume fly larva. There's one that they um, bake locusts whole, and you eat them, okay? There, there's one of their delicacies they're famous for is the eyeball of a tuna, okay? Now, let me just put this in perspective. A, a, the, the eyeball of a tuna is about the size of a racquetball, okay? Just to kind of give you some perspective. So he proceeds to tell me, he said, when that youth leader unveiled what they would be required to eat or drink if they lost, he said, when he, they finally unveiled it, he said, the, kid, the students, they freaked out. I mean, there was screaming, he said. I mean, they got real serious. I am not going to lose this game, okay? And he said, I mean, they, they were terrified by this, okay? And then he told me what it was that they would have to consume, okay? I'm just going to show you a picture of this. This is what they unveiled for those students. He said they unveiled the Dr. Pepper, a can of Dr. Pepper, and there was screaming. The student's like, oh my goodness, have you ever had that? That is disgusting. You can barely get it down your throat. Why would you make us drink this, they were saying. I mean, they were freaking out. And my friend's like, are you serious, okay? He said he wanted to lose. He was trying to lose so he could get that Dr. Pepper. Okay, here's the principle here. Culture, it normalizes things. And what's normal in one culture may seem so foreign in another culture and vice versa. This is true of whole societies. It's also true of cities. When you kind of small in this, this cultural circle, it's true of cities. Okay, uh, Rebecca and I, right after we got married, we moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where uh, we were doing some schooling. And um, we, Rebecca's from Washington, D.C., and I'm from down here in South Florida. And um, when you go to another city, there's like driving culture that's different. And our normal speed of driving in South Florida, some people consider fast, okay? And when I moved to Louisville, I I mean, I was behind these slow pokes. I mean, they were going only five miles over the speed limit, okay? It's crazy. All right, and 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 then I realized, like, in their Louisville driving culture, Dude, they run red lights like it's unbelievable, okay? Like, I don't know what their deal is. They just run red lights all the time. Like, in our culture, as long as you're in the intersection before it turns red, like, you're in the clear, right? Okay? In Louisville, it turns red, and then, like, three more cars go through. It's unbelievable, all right? And so even within cities, what's normal in one city might seem foreign another. That's the way culture works. Okay, let me give you one more example, because that's true in a family as well. I want to tell you, this is an old preacher story, okay? I don't even know if it's true, but preachers tell this story. But it, it illustrates this point. There's a woman, and she's cooking, and she gets her young daughter, and she's, she's saying, hey, um, 
I want to show you how to cook, and she's, she's making a ham, okay? She's baking it, and so she takes the ham, she cuts off the ends, puts it in the pan, and then puts it in the oven, and the daughter says, Mom, why do you cut off the ends of the ham? She says, well, that's how you make, that's how you cook a ham, and she says, but why? She says, I don't know, and so she called her mom and said, hey, why do you cut the ends off a ham? And she says, well, that's how you cook a ham. She says, well, but why? And she says, actually, I don't know. Call your grandma. So she calls her grandma. Grandma, why do we cut off the ends of the ham? And she says, I never had a pan big enough to fit it, so I cut off the ends <laughs> and put it in the pan, okay? So that's what culture does, right? Whether in society or in a city or in a family, there's culture. I mean, you know there's corporate culture too, Right? The place that you work, the company that you're at, there's corporate culture. There are things that are normalized in that. And and here's the thing. Culture is normalizing. That's what it does, whether we are intentional or not. It doesn't wait for us to normalize. That is a product of culture, no matter the sphere. But if we can be intentional with how we are normalizing in that culture... We are harnessing an incredible power. And the shift just sometimes is just a matter of saying, okay, I'm not just going to let this happen accidentally. Let me be intentional and normalize. And there is no sphere where that is more true than in the sphere we're talking about through this series, the family. There is, there is culture in a family, and there are things that those who come up in that family, that is normal to them. And so we're faced with the option of either letting normalizing happen on accident or with intentionality. And if we can harness it with intentionality, we are harnessing an incredible power. I want you to take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. I don't know where you're at when it comes to family, what stage of life you're at. You may be just leaving your, your parents' home. You may be about to leave your parents' home. That means you are about to be the culture setter of your own home and family. You may be newlyweds, and you are just now setting the culture. You may have young kids, and, or you may have students. They are growing up in the culture you're setting for them. You may have stepkids that just come through your house um, every now and then when they're not at your ex's house. You are, you're, you're normalizing things. You may have grandkids. No matter what stage of life you're at, we are normalizing for our family. And I want you to see what this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4, says about this important truth. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house. And on your gates. Now we, um, the challenge from last week was to take this section of the Bible, these six verses, to write them on a three by five card, fold it up, and carry it in your pocket everywhere you go as a reminder of what this is saying. And, and the challenge was to take a verse a day and begin memorizing that. Um, if you didn't get a chance to do that this week, I would challenge you to do that. Let these words sink in. This is one of the most quoted portions of the Old Testament. And we said that this section actually has a name. It's a Hebrew word. Anyone remember what the name of the section is? The Shema. That's right. The Shema is the name of this section. And that comes from the very first word in this whole section here. That's the Hebrew word, Shema. And it's saying, let this sink in, Israel. And we talked about this this section is, um, Jesus said, is so important when he was asked, what's Hey, Jesus, what's the greatest law of God? He actually quoted the Shema. And he indicated that it was on this that the whole Old Testament is built. It's kind of like a summary of the teaching of the Old Testament. And actually, the story of the Old Testament is this section. 
And we talked about what this is saying, and we looked at this key verse, these first two verses, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. In other words, love God with everything you've got. Cultivate a love for God. Not just an empty obedience. A love for God. You know, that's why when we gather together, we're commanded in Scripture to sing. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. We're commanded that each generation is rising up songs out of their worship to God. We're commanded to sing when we come here. The power of music is commanded in Scripture to kindle our hearts and our love for God. And there's a dynamic that happens when we come together and sing together to sing for the Lord. Don't underestimate the importance of us gathering together to sing. There's unfortunately sometimes in, um, there are people that go to church and view the songs at the beginning kind of like the previews to the movie. It's like, okay, it's if, I, if I miss some, no, that is part of what we're commanded to do. Sing to the Lord. It's a command. We sing to the Lord. Why? It cultivates in our heart love for God. We're commanded to love God with all that we've got. And we said, okay, let's just put this as simply as possible. In other words, what this chat section is trying to say, your relationship with God is the single greatest priority in your life. Let's put it as simply as possible, as clearly and as directly as possible. Your relationship with God is the single greatest priority in your life. Why? Think about it in two ways. The first is theologically. God is the ultimate thing. If we make something a greater priority than God, we are making that our ultimate thing. In other words, we're making that our God. That makes that an idol. And what happens if we put anything higher than God as an ultimate thing? There is nothing that is equipped to be the ultimate thing like the one being God Almighty who is the ultimate thing. Nothing else will, will stand as an ultimate thing. It will crumble under the pressure. What do you mean? Let's put it like this. Um, if you or I make money the ultimate thing, it will fail us and it will crush us. Like, let me just ask you this question. Okay, you, we know this. Does money make people happy? No. The funny thing is, as a culture that so often idolizes money, we know it doesn't make us happy. We say, well, I'm not looking to get, like, you know, super rich. If I could just have a little bit more, then I'd be happy. That's the whole cycle that every single human who puts money first is in. It doesn't matter how much you have because you're like, well, I have this, this, but look at that guy. He's got that. Well, I have that, but this guy's got an upgraded version of that. And look at this person. They have this, and there's, there will always be the the craving and the gnawing that if I had a little bit more, then I would be happy. Putting money first creates in us this churn of discontentment, and it actually leaves us less happy. Money cannot serve as God. It crumbles. How about success? Man, the moment we get to a new pinnacle, oh, I got this promotion, but wait, what about that job? What about that job? Or I grew my company to this place, but, well, look at that company. And there's always like another pinnacle or another place I could get to. And if you actually one day get to the greatest pinnacle, then you've got the fear that there's someone constantly nipping at your heels about to topple you over. That's why all throughout history you see tyrants and kings and queens and dictators and despots who murder their family members. Because they're threatened they're going to steal their power that they finally got. Success is an ultimate thing, cannot bear the stress, and it crumbles and crushes us, leaving us less happy. How about relationships? A friendship, a dating relationship, a marriage, or even a relationship with a child? If that's put, that cannot handle the weight of being an ultimate thing because that puts such great expectations 
on that other person, it will not only crumble the relationship, it will crush them and us at the same time. There's only one thing that is rightfully supposed to be our priority. That's with God. That is true theologically, but it's also true practically. What Jesus said, and we talked about this last week, is out of our relationship with God, it trickles and cascades into every other part of our life. Every single slice of our life is affected by our relationship with God. Let me give you one example, and I want you to dive deep with me on this for a second. If my framework for my relationship with God is based on this idea of when I'm good, God's happy with me, and when I've been messing up, I feel far from him. Like I have this performance-based relationship with God, that will affect my framework with other people. And so I'll be constantly trying to earn their acceptance by my performance, whether that's a parent, a spouse, a friend, someone else. I'll be always trying to earn their acceptance. And it will be empty. And it will break down my life. But the greater tragedy is that will be the framework through which I handle other people. I will withhold my acceptance until they're performing correctly. And that crushes. But if my relationship with God is anchored into the reality that he accepts me first, that he loves me just how I am, that he loves me so much he's aware that I'm a mess, he's drawing me out of that mess, but he loves me even while I'm in that mess, if I believe the truth that he sent Christ Jesus, his only son, to die on the cross to pay for my sins, and that he rose again from the dead, and if I choose to believe the truth that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and if I believe the truth that he has this unconditional love because he's washed me clean by the blood of Christ and I'm forgiven and he has this unconditional love for me and he pours out his grace and his forgiveness on me, man, out of that framework is how I'll handle my relationships. I'll be capable of forgiving. I'll be capable of having patience. I'll be capable of having love for the people who are tough to love. And so what we're challenged is very simply... A relationship with God is the highest priority in our lives. we got to give it everything we've got, all our heart and soul and might. And then here's where the passage goes next. And train your children with it. The most important thing in our life is our relationship with God. The most important thing we leave behind is our children and a legacy of faith in our children. Now, there's two parts of this. One is realizing the treasure that our children are, and this is not hard for us to grasp in our culture. We get distracted from it. And sometimes we're prioritizing our career or our accolades or even hobbies over our children. And it doesn't take a whole lot for us to tap back into that parental instinct, that instinct as a grandparent, that instinct of realizing the treasure and the gift that these little ones are. It doesn't take much for us to stop. And this is how we put it last week because we're just like, hey, let's just be real with this. One day when we're laying on our deathbed, we're not going to care about our hobbies. We're not going to care about our accomplishments. We're not going to care about our careers and any rewards and any acknowledgments or fame or recognition. We're going to want our family around us. And it's not hard for us to go there and say, okay, my kids have got to be the most important thing that I leave behind and accomplish with this life. But here's where we are challenged. Of the things we can build into our kids, what this is saying is there's nothing more important than leaving them with a legacy of faith. And see, that's the thing that challenges us because there's a lot of things that we say like, okay, I want them to be educated. I want them to uh, I give them opportunities in their extracurriculars and I, I want to tr- train them this way. But what this thing is, the most important thing to pass on to my kids is their legacy of faith. Because what we typically say in our culture is, I just want my kids to be happy. But what did we just talk about? My goodness, if you want your kids to be happy, introduce them to the love of their creator and the love of Jesus Christ. Because if I want them to be happy and I set them out of my house, putting something above God, I'm setting them up of a life to be crushed and to find unhappiness. 
And if I want my kids to be happy, help them be worshipers of God, followers of Christ, ordering their life by following God first and foremost so that his spirit can produce the fruit of joy in their life regardless of what life circumstances bring them. If our faith is the most important thing in our life, then the most important thing to develop in our children's lives is their faith. But here's the challenging and intimidating thing we say. We say, okay, but man, that's hard. Maybe uh, there's many that say, look, I don't... I would love to do that. I didn't have that in my home. I have, n- growing up, I, maybe you say, I have no idea how to do that. I don't even know where to begin on how to do that. Well, that's what this text teaches us, and that's what we're going to spend the next few weeks and the continuing to dig out. But here's the good news. Today, I want you to look at the next two verses in this text that we're studying, because if we can understand these next two verses, it's 80% of the ball game. is this one concept. I want you to see the next two verses. Look at, last week we were looking at four and five. I want you to look at six and seven. Let me read these again to us. Here's what it says. And these words that I command you today shall be on your, what does that say? Be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. He's already told us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and might. And he's reemphasizing that and he's putting these two verses together intentionally. He's saying, man, it's got to be on your heart. It can't just be something that you that we hear in a sermon and we say, yes, that's true, and we don't digest it. It can't be something we hear but we don't really hear. It can't be something that we affirm is true, but we don't swallow it, get it down into our hearts, and let it pump through our veins. It's got to be something that we own. Okay, I'm taking this by the handles. I'm going to give everything I've got to make my relationship with God my number one priority. What needs to shift and change and move out of the way to make that my priority in my life? It's got to be on our hearts. we got to own it, believe it. And know it and do it. And then it says, and teach it diligently to our children. Now, this word teach diligently in the ancient Hebrew is really interesting. It's actually means, it's literally translates a metaphor. It's literally translating sharpen your children. Like think like sharpening a sword. Or they would sharpen the, the head of an arrow which is a really interesting metaphor. Consider this verse in Psalm 127. Let me read it to you. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. The Bible says children are like an arrow. Um, I was given this as a gift. Um, There's a missionary that we together as a church support in Burkina Faso. Her name is Amy Rittering. She's actually here a few weeks ago. And one time on her way back, she brought me this um, traditional uh, bow and arrow back from uh, Burkina. And um, I can see the looks on your faces. You guys are nervous, just me even holding this up here. I have no business holding a weapon like this. And I thought Amy knew me better than that. Anyway, um, but she brought these back and um, I, I leave them up in my office um, to remind me of this truth that even though I'm called as a pastor and uh, my, my wife and I are, we're called to, to pour in the spiritual development of the people at, here at our church, um, the number, the main priority of spiritual development is my own children. That's who I'm responsible for. And here's what's kind of cool. She, she gave me these. It's a pack, bundle of three arrows and um, this is uh, significant to me because um, some of you may have seen on Facebook, Rebecca and I are expecting our third child going to be here in the spring. Thank you. Very excited about that. And um, we've been talking to our other two about name ideas, getting name ideas from my five-year-old and three-year-old. Um, I asked my five-year-old daughter, I was like, hey, sweetheart, if, if um, we have a girl, if our baby is a girl, what should we name it? And she said, oh, I know. Sparkle flower unicorn. Okay. I'm not sure about the double middle name thing, I, but okay. And then I looked at my, my three-year-old son. I'm like, hey, buddy, if, if, um, if we have a boy baby, what should we name, name the boy? And without blinking, he said, 
Batman. <laughs> Which, <laughs> Batman Barnes, oh, that could be something there, okay? So I haven't ruled that one out, okay? Anyway, the idea is as parents, we are called to take our children and we're sharpening them. They're like arrows that we launch them into their lives, like warriors. I mean, in antiquity, a, a skilled archer was feared. They were deadly accurate. For centuries, it was one of the most feared weapons. And the idea is we launch these children out of our homes and we've sharpened them. And how have we sharpened them? We've sharpened them with the truths of this scripture. And so think about what this is saying to us. I mean, this is saying something a powerful. It's saying that chiefly their spiritual development is on us as parents. That's a shift in culture for many of us. Because when it comes to developing our children... We often, in certain areas, and it's not necessarily a bad thing in some areas, but there are some areas that we subcontract their development out to experts. So, like, if they're in ballet, we take them to a ballet expert. If they're in soccer, we take them to a soccer expert. If they need tutoring, we take them to a tutoring expert in a particular subject. If they're learning to play the bassoon, they go to a bassoon teacher, okay? We, we subcontract that out to experts, and that's not necessarily bad but we cannot operate with that dynamic when it comes to the spiritual side of their development. Well, what is church? Church is not just the spiritual expert that you bring your kids to and say, okay, develop them spiritually. In the category of their spirituality, it cannot happen like that. Is it essential to get your kids to church regularly? Of course, because we're partnering together with parents and grandparents. We're partnering together to raise them up spiritually. Why is the category of spirituality something that cannot be subcontracted out? The way this passage is laid out, it gives us a window into that. Notice the order that it put it. It said, first, put it on your heart. It says that first. Put it on your heart. In other words, you've got to own it. Your relationship with God and its priority. Own that. And then it says... Teach it diligently with, to your children. There's a reason why I think it's put there in that order. Why? Because didn't we just say? The spiritual side of our relationship cascades into every part of our lives. There is a culture in our homes that is normalizing whether we like it or not. Whether we're intentional about it or not. It is normalizing things. And since spirituality, is, since every part of our life is affected by our relationship with God, all these categories that are being normalized in these children's lives are teaching them something spiritually. Let me put it differently. Every one of us is training the children in our lives spiritually. Every one of us already are, whether we realize it or not. There are moments that it just strikes me as I look down into my children's eyes, and there's times when I see their little eyes looking up at me, and I'm just struck by the vulnerability in those eyes. Because how I live is crafting what's normal for their world, unlike any other stage of life. Wes Stafford, the former president of Compassion International, works with children all over the globe. He said, children are like wet cement. These impressions we're placing into them. I realize that those little eyes from my son, how he's seeing me treat my wife, his mother, is what he will think is normal for how a man treats a woman. Those two little eyes looking up at me from my daughter, how she sees me treat my wife, her mom, that is what's being normalized in her about how a man treats a woman, and that is how she will, she will expect and what she will see as normal for how a man will treat her one day. 
what's happening in children is we are creating normalcy. Normalizing their world and their perspective. And we can either do that by accident or do that with intentionality. There is an incredible power in doing that with intentionality. You, maybe someone is tempted to say, well, when it comes to the spiritual side, I mean, we don't talk much about the spiritual stuff. Well, that's teaching them something about God. We're teaching them spiritual things, whether we're intentional or not. If I don't talk about the spiritual side, if that's just something that we do on an occasional Sunday, I'm teaching them that that's normal. I'm teaching them that the relationship with God is just a one activity thing we do sometimes called church, not something that affects their career and their job and their school and their relationships and their finances and their calling and their goals and all of those things. I, whether we like it or not, we are normalizing in our homes. And this passage is calling us. It's saying, man, capture, c- capture the power of normalizing in our children's lives. You say, man, I, that's, that's an intimidating thing. You know, I, I don't know how to do that. And that's what we're going to take the rest of this series. We're going to be talking through like how this passage equips us, and we're going to talk about things that it talks about, like rhythms. We're going to talk about how to seize unexpected opportunities, but plan opportunities. We're going to talk about um, things like setting up boundaries for what influences you're letting into your home, and we're going to talk about all these very practical things, but today it gives us one thing that I think is 80% of the ball game. If we can make our relationship with God our own personal priority, and run hard after that, and live that out as a person, not as some private thing of our life. We live it out like we're called to do that. Our kids will see that example, and that grace, and that gospel, and that truth, and that faith, and all of those fruits of the Spirit, and all those practices, and all those disciplines, and all those implications in various parts of my life will flow out around me and create culture and create what's normal in our kids' lives. So number one step, parent, step parent, number one step, grandparent, future parent, number one step is to figure out a way to take one one next step in running after God with all you've got and make keeping him as the priority. Let me give you one practical thing. Can everyone just take out a, a pen uh, to write something down? Go ahead and take out a pen. I want you to write. I'm going to give men, I'm going to give you a title to a book. Ladies, I'm going to give you a title to a book. And here's my challenge to you is to order this book on Amazon um, today um, before you go to bed. If you have the Amazon app on your phone, pull it up, order it right now on your phone. Okay, I want to I wanna challenge you to pick up this book. And here's the challenge is to give, surrender to the biggest priority in your life, your relationship with God, surrender 20 minutes in the morning. Get up 20 minutes early, get the coffee set ahead of time. That's a spiritual discipline that you need to have in your life, okay? I got a hallelujah for that, all right? I, I, want, I want you to set the coffee early. I want you to give 20 minutes early, earlier in the morning. Set your alarm. You say, what if I set the alarm and I hit the snooze button 17 times like always, Okay. Put the alarm clock on the other side of the room. Do you actually know that there have now alarm apps that you have to do math in other to, twi- to turn off the alarm? Have you heard of this? They have QR codes that you have to scan and you can put it in another part of the house that your alarm won't go off on your phone until you scan the QR code, okay? If that's what you have to do, people, I'm telling you, okay, whatever it takes, 20 minutes earlier in the morning, Read a chapter a day. Give that to yourself. Okay, men, here's the book. I want you to write this down. It's called Disciplines of a Godly Man, Man, and the author's name is Kent Hughes. He's a pastor that served for decades um, right outside of Chicago. This is a phenomenal book. If you're a brand new Christian or if you've been following Jesus for decades, I want you to pick this book up and just go through this. It's just written really in an easy way to understand Super practical, okay, and give you great ways to pursue God. Disciplines of a Godly Man by R. Kent Hughes. Ladies, here's the book. I want you to write this down. 
It's called Disciplines of a Godly Woman. It's written by his wife, Barbara Hughes. Um, also, just very, it's great read, easy to read, and it's got great practical resources that will shape uh, you up and continuing to run hard after God. Okay, I just imagine for me for a second, if every person in our church committed themselves between now and the end of the year, 20 minutes a day, and went through this book. I mean, imagine what that would do in our homes. Imagine what that would do just in our church if we all just committed ourselves, okay, God, if you say it, I'm going to do it. You're the most important thing. I'm going to give time to developing this in my life, okay? Men, I'm, I'm challenging you to lead the way. It, here's the challenge, okay? Don't let the ladies win, okay? You get your book first, all right? All right, you guys are looking at me blankly. I'm seeing some blank stares. Okay, men, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's lead the way on this. Let's go through this. Imagine what can happen in our homes. I'm thinking about those of you, you say, look, I don't even have kids in, I'm not even in a relationship, let alone kids. One of the best things you could do is begin preparing now for that relationship. I begin preparing now for God and trusting you to kids. And one of the best, the most important thing you can do is, is give yourself time, God, to work in your life developing the spiritual side of your relationship. Disciplines of a Godly Man by Kent Hughes, Disciplines of a Godly Woman by Barbara Hughes. Let, let's, let's, give, let's put this as a priority in our life because the first step, do you notice the first step? We're talking about raising kids, but for the first two weeks, we're saying, let's start with ourselves. The best parenting move you might possibly ever do is reprioritize your life spiritually. The best thing you can do for your grandkids, your stepkids, your future kids is get yourself grounded spiritually. Consider doing that. Now, I want to just, one last thing as we close. I want to speak to those of you who are here that going through this series, as you go through this series, it's making you actually lose hope. I want to speak to those of you who say, you don't understand my my kids are almost already grown or, you know, that, that cement seems like it's pretty much hardened. Or they're out of my house. Or I don't get to see my grandkids very often. How can I have an influence on them? Or, or more than half the time they're at my ex's house and you should see the culture that's in that house. I mean, what, how can I combat that? And you're tempted to lose hope. Can I just remind you where your hope is found? It's not in yourself, parent. It's not in your godliness, grandparent. It's not in your faithfulness, step-parent. It's not in your ability to, to build your culture and to, to build a culture in your future home, future parent. Your hope is not in you. Your hope is in Jesus Christ your Savior. And if that is the source of your hope, Christian, that means you, have, you never have the license to lose hope because his power can never be stopped. Do you realize the story of the gospel? God gave up his son. He lost his child so that your lost child can be found. That is the story of the gospel. It's that he surrendered up Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh. He surrendered up his only son, Jesus, so that your child, who's on loan to you right now, can be called a child of God. That is the story of the gospel. Do not ever, 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 ever lose hope. Keep praying. Keep surrendering. Keep working. Because he has a story with his child that's on loan to you. He loves them more than you love them. He has a story and he's not finished. Don't ever lose hope. Now I want to speak to some of you today because there's some that are here or some that are watching online and I believe you are one of those children you may be grown up now. 
but there's been someone, and I bet you may even know who they are, that they have been praying for you for decades. There's someone's grandchild here. Someone's son or daughter, someone's brother or sister, someone's friend. And you know there's that person who's been praying for you and you're that one who's lost and you feel so far from God. Can I tell you today, you are not far from God because he has drawn near to you. He leaves the 99 to find the one. And here's what I want to ask you. Could today be the day all of those prayers on your behalf are answered? Find your salvation today. It's not about what you do, it's about what he did. Just believe that and find your salvation, find forgiveness. You're not far from God, he's waiting right here before you with open arms. Find salvation today. If that's you, let me just lead you in a prayer. Would you all bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're watching online, would you just take a prayerful posture and if you want to put your faith in Jesus today, then just please repeat these words after me in your heart, just silently there before God. Just say, God, I want to be found by you. Thank you for accepting me. You know that I have many mistakes in my life. But I believe you paid for my sin by the death of Jesus on the cross. And I believe you rose again from the dead. He is my Savior. And I want to follow after you. You're my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.